Last, um, <clears throat> excuse me, last Sunday, we heard the story of Hannah at the beginning of the book of 1 Samuel. And this Sunday, we are hearing the last words of David from the very end of 2 Samuel. Now, there's a lot that happens in between, of course. But these sort of bookends of this story of the rise of David as king over Israel come on a day when traditionally the church thinks about Christ as king. For, as we read, David praises God for making an everlasting covenant with him, ordered in all things and secure. Will God not cause to prosper all my help and my desire? David asks. And of course... As Christians, we have interpreted this everlasting covenant to be about Jesus Christ, the son of David, who reigns eternally as king at the right hand of the Father. Now, the only problem with this is that we've tended to take a much better view of David than the Bible itself does. Think about those stories that you learned about David in Sunday school. David's the hero in most of them, isn't he? There are all these great stories about how David has faith in God, David and Goliath, all these stories that get right up to the point when David becomes king. And that's when things begin to go south. I'm willing to bet that all of us can name one story about David after he becomes king. Because there's only one story that's ever brought up in Sunday school. And that is... Uriah the Hittite, or better known as David and Bathsheba, for Uriah's wife. And David doesn't come off so well in this story. But for the Sunday school version, we say, oh, this was a moment of weakness. We, we sort of whitewash it so it's a little more palatable. And David stays good, that man after God's own heart. But if you actually go and read 2 Samuel, because it's in 2 Samuel where David is king, you find out that the story of David and Uriah and Bathsheba isn't all that out of character for David the king. David the king is a man who can't control his own desires or his own family. And some of this ambivalence about David is to be understood as later people going back and editing these stories to make them make sense when they cannot understand how this everlasting covenant has been broken because there is no king of David's line in Jerusalem, because all the Judeans are in exile in Babylon, and Jerusalem is destroyed. But even before that, you don't have to look at those other kings to figure out where the story of David goes bad. It's right there in David's own story those stories that we tend not to talk about in church. The big one is about David's daughter, Tamar. David had many wives and many children. But the Bible tells us that Tamar was beautiful. And her brother, Amnon, David's heir, desired her. And just as David his father did with Bathsheba before him, Amnon took what he wanted from Tamar without thought of consequences. And things begin to go south because in the story, David is entirely ruled by fear. He is afraid to do anything to Amnon because he is afraid that he will destroy his dynasty before it starts. So no one does anything for Tamar. Until finally, her brother Absalom kills Amnon and drives David out of Jerusalem 
Absalom declares that he is king now and not his father. And so David, afraid of losing the power that he worked all his life to accumulate, wages war on his son and kills Absalom. And that is that. Everything is downhill from there for the rest of David's reign. And yet, and yet, these are the last words of David. Words that ring a little hollow as they proclaim how wisely David has ruled. We all have selective memory sometimes, don't we? But David is the lens through which Christians have understood what it means for Jesus to be king for thousands of years. Sometimes, most of the time, that lens is a study in contrast. We proclaim that Christ is the son of David and a king, but not a king like David. As we heard Jesus tell Pilate today, my kingdom is not from this world. It doesn't act the way that you expect it to. It's got a different set of logic. And we're familiar with the logic of David's kingdom. Because even though we don't use those words kings and kingdom much anymore, doesn't this story of petty power politics still ring true? Don't we see our leaders today in this country ruled by their own fears of losing power? It doesn't matter what political party they're a part of. And don't we see the way that fear is used to control us? That's the way it means to be a king in this world. But Jesus is not a king like that. Jesus' kingdom is not from this world, and it shows us a different way to live. A way in which the love of God casts out our fears. And this is a frightening time in which to live. There are many things of which we may legitimately be afraid. But the consistent message of the Bible is do not fear. Be still and know that I am God. The Lord your God is with you. Jesus' last words to his disciples are, I will not leave you or forsake you. I will be with you always. And with this model of kingship, with a king who came not to be served, but to serve, we find a love that is bigger than our fears, than David's fears. A love in which none of us, not even David, are beyond redemption. It's a different way of seeing the world, a way of trusting in God's promises of abundance rather than the scarcity which the world tells us is all around us. Jesus' kingdom is not of this world, and thank God for that. Amen.